Hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Odo Sendai Dukai and in this video you will get a good overview over the legendary topic of 16-bit, 24-bit and 32-bit floating point. And the reasons why. I would like to ask you to give me a thumbs up for the video and even better subscription as a small appreciation for the many helpful videos. Then let's get started. The bit depth, which you will find on all kinds of audio devices and settings, describes nothing else than the dynamic range that can be used. What does that mean? In practice, dynamic range is always described as the range between the loudest and the quietest sound. In other words, the maximum opposite extremes of, for example, a sound, a sample loop, or a song. So, it's a very simple thing. The bit depth defines the maximum possible dynamic range, in other words, how many volume levels are possible in this defined range. And there are three very prominent values here. 16-bit, 24-bit, 32-bit floating point. 16-bit and 24-bit are fixed point numbers, and 32-bit floating point is, as the name suggests, a floating point number. I'm going to go into a little more detail now to give you the basics so that you know the huge difference and significance between fixed point numbers and floating point numbers, why this is the case and why it plays a very important role in many considerations, especially in music production, but perhaps not in the era you are probably thinking of. Relax. Even if it goes into depth, I will provide useful examples so that the whole topic remains simple and easy to understand. Let's go! When looking at different numbers, such as fixed point numbers or floating point numbers, it is important to determine the exact range or number sets to be looked at. By this I mean, for example, whether only all positive numbers should be viewed, in other words from 0 up to 1, 2, 3, 15, 47, 321, or also the negative numbers minus 1, minus 57, minus 477. This will become very important later for one of the killer features. This allows certain ranges to be defined depending on how large a number can become. Example. This means that if I have a total of 110 numbers available, which I can divide equally into negative and positive numbers. In other words, from minus 55 to plus 55, then this is called bias. In computer science, such an even bias is called signed or unsigned in the number definition. In other words, signed with a plus and minus sign, or unsigned without a sign, then only plus. The different numbers minus 55 and plus 54 are the result of the fact that zero has to be counted as a kind of positive number. This is also because the counting method in computer science always starts from zero. In other words, when counting 10 numbers from zero to nine. Another example would be the range from minus 128 to plus 127 for a total of 256 numbers. A little additional information. The bias does not necessarily have to define two sets of the same size. It can also be divided into sets of different sizes. If I take the number 256 and expect the smallest number in my calculations to be negative 10, for example, then I can move the bias upwards or redefine it so that I can distribute all 256 numbers into the following range from minus 10 to plus 245. This means that I can now display larger numbers than plus 127. In other words, the bias determines whether I only have positive numbers or how I distribute my numbers on the negative and positive side. In computer science, the most common biases are either only positive or an even distribution in negative and positive. Now the fixed point numbers. In other words, the 16-bit and the 24-bit. A fixed point number is a number that consists of fixed numbers of digits 
before and after the decimal point. In other words, the position of the decimal point is fixed, that is why it has its name. For example, prices on products always have two decimal places. That was easy. With floating point numbers, in other words, as with 32-bit floating points, the position of the decimal point is, as the name suggests, not fixed. The decimal point can float back and forth. But a little history and background is interesting here, because too often people associate these numbers exclusively with computers. Where they are of course used a lot, but floating point numbers have been around for longer, and not just for computers. The first document use of floating point notation is found in the year 1750 BC. In other words, almost 4000 years ago, for scientific calculations based on 60 instead of, for example, 10 for our decimal system or 2 for the binary system in computers. In 1913, the Spanish engineer Leonardo Torres Quevedo first described the idea of floating point arithmetics in computers. The first use of floating point representation in computers was then implemented 25 years later in 1937 by Konrad Zuse in his Z1 and Z3 computers. There are various standardizations for floating point numbers, such as the base 10, the decimal system, or the base 2, the binary system, which were first defined in 1985 in the IEEE 754 standard and later in the current IEEE 754-2019. This standard is implemented in most of today's CPUs. So why do we need these numbers now? In the natural science, numbers are often much smaller, for example, like the atomic radius of hydrogen, about 0.000000000032 meters. In other words, a number with 10 zeros, or simply 32 picometers. Or much larger, like the light year with about 9 quadrillion 460 trillion meters. In other words, a number with 16 digits, or simply 9.46 trillion kilometers. With such small or large numbers, the notation is confusing due to the many zeros or digits. For this reason, the power notation has become established, in which the number is broken down into the digits and the decimal point shift. In this notation, the numbers are significantly shorter and easier to read. 30 times 10 to the power of minus 12 for 0 0.000000032 meters with 10 zeros, where the decimal point must be shifted 12 places to the right so that the meter becomes 32 picometers. And 9.46 times 10 to the power of 15 for 9. 460000000000000 meter with 13 zeros, where the decimal point must be shifted 15 places to the left so that the meters become 9.46 trillion kilometers. In summary, this means that the exponents minus 12 or plus 15 superscribed after the base 10 in this power notation indicates by how many places the decimal point must be shifted to the left or right. In other words, the decimal point does not have a fixed position, but the position slides to a different position depending on the number, which is why the term floating point number is used. There's another major difference between the terms fixed point number and floating point number, namely the precision and exactness of the numbers. The specification of a fixed point number is absolutely precise and exact. A number 47.25 is absolutely precise and exact. When specifying a floating point number, absolute precision is not normally intended and the relative precision is strongly related to the number of digits specified. What does this mean? 
In practice, it could be said that when specifying a one light year with a distance of 9.46 trillion kilometers, one or two meters of accuracy is not really important. The same applies to very small numbers. The word approximately in everyday language is actually quite suitable here. Um, you're probably more likely to say it is approximately 20 kilometers to the next restaurant instead of exactly 19.3725 kilometers. In other words, depending on the size of the number, it is rounded up or down for practical considerations um, or the information up to the last number is not important for the result in a particular case. So now I come to the points floating point numbers in the computer. Each number consists of a number of digits. For example, the number 104 as text has three digits. A digit is a unit of information or piece of information that has to be stored somehow. In other words, it needs space on storage medium such as a hard disk, USB stick, SD card or RAM. There are certain size units for this such as bit, byte, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte, yottabyte. And as you all know, the smallest unit in a computer is a bit, and 8 bits are always one byte. This can be represented in a decimal system with a base of 10, or, as is usual in computers, a binary system with a base 2. The terms are often used widely back and forth between these labels in everyday life, but the table with the binary system is actually the correct one. Whatever, so... However, numbers are not stored as text or individual digits with one byte each. Instead, they are stored in their own number format or number types, which are called, for example, integer or float and so on, in order to save memory space. Here are a few examples of data types and memory requirements. The terms and sizes may vary slightly depending on the programming language, but as an orientation and overview for understanding, this is absolutely sufficient. There are different memory requirements definitions for numbers of different sizes. For example, the number 104 from my example, with a total of three digits as text, would require three bytes. The larger the number, the more digit it has and the more memory it needs. Quite logical. But in the past, it was not an option to work so wastefully anyway and today it is not wanted as the amount of data has increased enormously. Memory requirements are closely related to efficiency. In other words, how quickly a computer can load and process information. In extreme cases, it has to touch every single byte when loading from the hard disk into the RAM or when performing calculations such as adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing and so on. And that is also a single work step each time with every single byte. The fewer steps you have to take, the faster the work is done. Very simple logic. With several billion bytes, it becomes clear why this takes time and why it makes a lot of sense to use every possible simplification. This is why there are abbreviations or units such as centimeters and meters and different data types definitions such as integer for fixed point or float for floating point numbers to simply save memory space. This is an absolutely simple principle, comparable to our language and the time we need to say something. Imagine someone saying the digits of large numbers one after the other instead of using a shortened and more comprehensive term. For example, if the individual digits of 1 trillion centimeters were spoken one after the other, namely 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 then it would simply take much longer than simply saying 1 trillion centimeters. Or to say 10,000 kilometers is more understandable and easier to grasp. Or perhaps to say the less common 10 megameters. Or to go to the other extreme and express it more difficult to understand in light years. In other words, the smaller the individual data unit is, the faster things progress. 
because here too, every little helps. So after this important background knowledge about where floating point numbers come from, what they are really good for and how they are used, I come to the point which is the big and important difference in the representation in the computer. And of course, what the killer feature of the floating point number is apart from the dynamics. You now know a lot about large and small numbers and that many digits also take much more time to process. That's why mathematics use shortcuts and I call them tricks to make processing more efficient in the computer. I will now limit myself to the 32-bit floating point definition of the IEEE 745 standard, you remember. And I simplify this now. This is a binary 32 single in Big Indian. These are now the bits as they are stored and this is the formula for it. W equals to V times M times B to the power of E. This is V as the sign or bias of the number, so plus one or minus one. M is the mantissa of the number. B is the base of the representation format. And E is the exponent of the number or the characteristic. Two things are extremely important to know here. Firstly, the base does not appear anywhere in this graphic. The reason for this is that the base in a computer has always two. This is because a bit only has two states, namely 0 or 1, and the entire computer is based on this. Since this is always the case, it can simply be assumed and can therefore be ignored. Secondly, what you don't see here, but which is again part of the saving potential, is that the mantissa in binary systems is always normalized to 1. This means that there's always one comma something. And since there's always a one, it is no longer stored, but simply always assumed, in other words, considered to be present. This now means the largest possible number with a base of 10 is approximately 3,4 times 10 to the power of 38. And the smallest possible number with base 10 is approximately 1 to 2 times 10 to the power of minus 38. In other words, numbers with up to 38 digits. Now we come to the soft core soap of the rough poodle. And remember, we are talking about a dynamic range here. In other words, how big the difference can be between the quietest sound and the loudest sound. In other words, how many volume levels are available and not volume. So, not something like, how loud can I turn up the PA so that people ears fall off? Perhaps a few more examples of volume specifications so that you can better classify dynamics. Rustling of leaves has 10 decibel. The silence in a radio studio is 20 decibel. The sound of breathing is about 25 decibel. Whispering has about 30 decibel. A normal conversation is about 60 decibel. A vacuum cleaner has about 70 to 80 decibel. A music concert is between 90 and 120 decibel. Chats taking off at a distance of 100 meter can have around 125 decibel or more. 130 decibel is the pain threshold for humans. This then leads to paralysis and destruction of the ganglion cells and thus to deafness. During the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano between the Indonesian islands of Sumatra and Java in 1883, a volume of 172 decibels was measured at a distance of 160 kilometers and the shockwave circled the entire Earth four to seven times. 174 decibel is the song of sperm whales. Very high sound levels above about 200 decibels usually lead directly to death. The actual cause of death is not the destruction of the hearing organ, but the bursting of the lung alveoli due to the pressure of the sound. The 5 cm pistol crab, also known as the cracker crab, causes a bang over 200 decibels. 
235 decibel is an earthquake of magnitude 5. 278 decibel is the explosion of an atomic bomb. 310 decibel was the Tunguska meteor in Siberia in 1908. And finally, 320 decibel was the eruption of the Tambora volcano in Indonesia in 1815. This is the loudest sound ever recorded on Earth. I hope this helps a little with the classification of what absolute volume is and what the range dynamics can cover. For 16-bit fixed point, these formulas result in an entire dynamic of 69 dB. For 20-bit fixed point, these formulas result in an entire dynamic of 100 44 dB. And for 32 floating point results in an entire dynamic of 1528 decibel divided in minus 758 dB and plus 770 dB. To summarize, the following can be said. Fixed point numbers are exact and precise but become rather confusing and complicated above a certain size. Floating point numbers are not as exact, but can be used very well for incredible large and small numbers. Both types of numbers are optimized as efficiently as possible for storage and processing in computers. 16-bit has a dynamic range of minus 9060 dB to 0 dBFS. 24-bit has a dynamic range from minus 144 dB to 0 dBFS and 32-bit floating point has a dynamic range of minus 758 dB to plus 707 dB. Taken together with the volume examples, this actually means that the 16-bit dynamic range with 96 dB should be completely sufficient. At 24-bit with 144 dB dynamic range at the latest, everything could be covered up to final deafness. In other words, why do we need 32-bit floating points with a dynamic range of 1528 decibel? Because 32-bit floating point has three features instead of just one. Already mentioned dynamic range from minus 758 dB to 770 dB, in other words, 1528 dB in total. Clipping. The fact that the headroom above 0 dBFS of 770 dB would be sufficient for the next big volcano eruption at least twice without clipping, if the physical material of the recording hardware can handle it all. And because 32-bit floating point can handle huge numbers and therefore only generates absolutely minimal rounding errors in the DAW internally or with plugins with up and down and over sampling, which therefore do not appear in the sound as artifacts or aliasing problems. Finally, a few thoughts regarding everyday life and use. Especially in many electronic music genres, the dynamics of many sounds are so compressed that they no longer have any dynamics. If they are also as well produced, then it makes absolutely no difference between 16-bit and 24-bit, except that the 24-bit files are larger. In general, this is simply a waste of space. The most popular music genres that make use of high dynamics are classical music, jazz and film music. Even if your DAW works with 32-bit float, it is recommended to stay below 0 dBFS anyway, because the sound has to get out of there at some point. And if you take this into account right from the start, you won't have any nasty surprises later when exporting. We are still talking about dynamics here, not volume. In other words, even if you mix your track at minus 40 dB, you can always use a tool or utility at the end and raise the volume so that you get close to the 0 dBFS. When recording, it is actually always an advantage to record in a 32-bit float, if only for the reason that clipping, in other words, when the level goes above 0 dB, is no longer quite so bad, even if poor recording hardware is overloaded. <laughs>
The disadvantage is, of course, that larger amounts of data are generated, which can be then reduced in post-processing. Dithering is absolutely unnecessary and even counterproductive with 32-bit floating point. With your current knowledge, you can answer the question about exporting stems or exporting for mastering yourself. Of course, when mastering, you should ask the mastering engineers about their optimal requirements. Now, you also have a better understanding of how to deal with the requirements of different sound sources and their processing during production. So, that was really quite intense and it was a lot of work for me to prepare this properly, but I hope it was worth it so the next time you are faced with the question of 32-bit floating point or get into a discussion about this topic, you then have the necessary knowledge to make the right decision or shed some light on the subject for others. And there is a lot of darkness on the subject of 32-bit floating points. My name is Odo Sendai Dukai. Thank you for your time and attention and I hope to see you soon again in the next video. Stay healthy, save the future, take care, see you then, ciao ciao!